Hello, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. Good morning. And we are we are continuing the stories of Jacob this morning. Last week was Jacob and his ladder. And today we're going to really look in depth uh, at the other uh, big uh, experience of his early, not so early, but mid years now is uh, wrestling with the angel from one, one set of angel angels to another one. Um, and this other big moment, both of them really mm -hmm. I, yes. iconic moments in, in, in his life, in Jacob's life. I mean, Jacob has a long life after this. He where he has a whole episodes with the, giving the coat to his uh, to Joseph, his um, next youngest son, and then being worried Joseph is dead, but then figuring out Joseph is still alive and going down and everything. But really the two most iconic moments in Jacob's life that and his life takes up more of the, the Torah than Abraham or Isaac or any of the earlier patriarchs in many ways um, is is uh, this, these two these two experiences, the latter and now the story of the wrestling with the angel. So what does it mean? So we're going to read the whole portion working up to it, and then we're going to look more in detail at the, the wrestling. What is the wrestling about? Um, and gotta gotta make sure Alan can read before the work on his roof starts. Okay, by Ishlach. Jacob sent messengers ahead to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, <clears throat> and instructed them as follows. Thus shall you say to my Lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, <clears throat> I stayed with uh, Lavan and remained until now. I have acquired cattle, asses, sheep, and male and female slaves. And I send this message to my Lord in the hope of gaining your favor. The messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau. He himself is coming to meet you and his retinue numbers 400. <clears throat> Jacob was greatly frightened in his anxiety. Oh, I'm sorry. Jacob was greatly frightened. In his anxiety, he divided the people with him and the flocks in, in herds and camels into two camps, thinking, if Esau comes to, what, to the one camp and attacks it, the other camp may yet escape. Then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham's house and God of my father Isaac's house, O oh Adonai, who said to me, return to your native land and I will deal bountifully with you. I am unworthy of all the kindness that you have so steadfastly shown your servant. With my staff alone, I crossed this Jordan and now I have become two camps. Deliver me, I pray, from the land of my brother, from the hand of Esau. Else I fear he may come and strike me down, mothers and children alike. Yet you have said I will deal bountifully with you and make your offspring as the sands of the sea, which are too numerous to count. After spending the night there, he selected from what was at hand these presents for his brother Esau. <clears throat> 200 she goats and 20 he goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk, milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 she asses and 10 he asses. These he put in the charge of his servants, drove by drove. And he told his servants, go on ahead and keep a distance between droves. He instructed the one in front as follows. When my brother Esau meets you and asks you, who's your master? Where are you going? And whose animals are these ahead of you? You shall answer, your servant Jacob's. They are a gift sent to my Lord Esau. And Jacob himself is right behind us. He gave second similar instructions to the second one and the third and all the others who followed the droves, namely 
Thus and so shall you say to Esau when you reach him. And you shall add, and your servant Jacob himself is right behind us. For he reasoned, if I propitiate with him, uh, if I propitiate him with presence in advance, and then favor, and then face him, perhaps he will show me favor. And so the gift went on ahead, and he remained in camp that night. That same night he arose, and taking his two wives, his two maidservants, and his eleven sons, he crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After taking them across the stream, he sent across all his possessions. Jacob was left alone, and a figure wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he, wrestled, he wrenched Jacob's hip at his socket, so that the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Said the other, what's your name? He replied, Jacob. Said he, your name will, shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with beings divine and human <clears throat> and have prevailed. Jacob asked, pray tell me your name. But he said, you must not ask my name. And he took leave of him there. So Jacob named the place place Peniel, meaning, I have seen a divine being face to face, yet my life has been preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping on his hip. That is why the children of Israel to this day do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the socket of the hip, since Jacob's hip socket was wrenched at the thigh muscle. Let's, let's read it a little bit more. Looking up, Jacob saw Esau coming with a retinue of 400. He divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maids, putting the maids and the children first, Leah and her children next, mm -hmm. and Rachel and Joseph last. Mm -hmm. He himself went on ahead and bowed low to the ground seven times until he was near his brother. Esau ran to greet him. He embraced him and falling on his neck, he kissed him and they wept. Looking about, he saw the women and children. Who, he asked, are these with you? He answered, he answered the children with whom God has favored your servant. Then the maids with their children. We can stop. I think it's a whole more of the reunion. It's okay, we can stop. We can stop for now because of uh, so this is the great climax of the whole uh, rivalry that we've seen between them. That's been going on for a few portions between Esau and Jacob coming together. Any thoughts? Any thoughts that came from reading this whole passage? I mean, Jacob is very, very wealthy ostensibly. Uh, a lot. That's a lot of. A lot of big, a big present he's sending away of his brother, all those camels and cows and sheep. Goats and, yeah. Well, he did steal his birthright and he did steal his blessing. Uh -huh. I, I think he's overcompensating a little bit. Um, there's definitely guilt, guilt towards his brother. Yeah. <clears throat> he seems. He's portrayed as being very clever, right? In that first section, we read how he how he deals with it, right? Sending them in three different droves, and each one he's very he's he's a he's a plotter, right? He's a thinker. He's thinking how to how to deal with his brother's anger, um, and he's he's very frightened, but he's not he's still able to come up with this plan, and then we have this mysterious incident. Um, Anything you were struck by as we were reading just a whole episode of the wrestling with the angel? First of all, it doesn't say angel, right? There's... No, it doesn't. It just says a man. 
next week. Uh -huh. Just as a man, exactly. Um, if we go back to the, let's go back to that section. Um, it says a figure, but really it is a man. Um, it's an ish, you will, I should. Figure. Um, let's see if I can put the Hebrew up. One sec. Verse 25, yeah. It says a figure. Yeah. It says a figure. Yeah. It says a figure in, in the uh, in this translation, but in the Hebrew it's an ish, but I'm just trying to how can I I'm not sure why it's not giving me any. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna do both Hebrew and English. There we go. Okay. Um, let's see, so we've gone down too far, verse 25. Um, so it's an ish, it's a figure, wrestled with him until the break of dawn. What would you think, just from reading that verse? Could be, it could be a man, right? Yeah. Just from reading that verse. Um, but if he's alone, he can't yes. be alone if there's another if there's another figure there, right? Mm -hmm. Unless the yeah. figure is not a man. Yeah. Unless the figure is somehow spiritual or godly or or not of this world. Yeah. Sort of an in-between character, partially yeah. partially material and partially something else. It's it's very it's interesting, isn't it? It's it's not as clear. I mean, I guess there's a, the other the part that we read, you know, a whole bunch of weeks ago when the three visitors come to Abraham, they also seem to be, they're also somewhere in between, right? They, they eat his meal. So you've got to be somewhat physical to be able to eat a meal. Um, and to, uh, it's a very, very interesting kind of depiction. Um, and there's this, whole, this big emphasis on, right, the hip, right, the socket. Um, Yeah. What do you make of this whole, when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched at Jacob's hip. Why, 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 if you were just reading that, why would you say, why did he do that? To try and last, last attempt to beat Jacob? I think it was, if he's wrenching his hip, it's to, it would appear to be to impair his mobility, to, to, make it harder for Jacob to move around, to walk, perhaps to follow, okay. follow, follow him. To, to leave a mark, to, to leave a mark I, of his presence more or less. Yeah, that, I think that's what, more what it was. But I, it, I don't think it's a quibble to say that um, it just says he touched him. That's as Alter points out. It, it's not in the intensive, it just says he touched him there which makes it sound like he's able to do that, shows he knows exactly where to touch or that he has some higher powers to use uh, uh, rather than he wrenched it or strained it. Uh, the result True, was, you, the result was but like you that. Got, but you got me to touch. Yes, sure. right, right. Uh, okay. and, and, and yes. So, so I mean, I, I don't want to put the focus on the translation, except it seems to me it it um, it interprets a little too much here. Let you let the reader figure it out. Like with the man, he wrestles with a man. He he looked like a man. He was a man. He talked sure, like a man. That's it. You know, it's a very it's a very interpretive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he's limping on that hip. I mean, what right? It was an effective. It was an effective touching or pressure point or whatever it was but right there was a little, little pressure point that took his whole hip out of so i went i went to a different translation which is a lot more literal mm -hmm. right and yaakov was left alone and there wrestled the man with him until the breaking of a day and when the man and when mm -hmm. he saw that he did not prevail against him he touched the hollow of his thigh and the hollow of yeah. yaakov's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him uh, r said uh and the socket of Jacob's hip became dislocated as he wrestled with him. Yeah, this would mean the same kind of. And doesn't Jacob maintain this injury for the whole rest of his life? 
I mean, I mean uh, that's that's what it seems to say, but we don't we don't really hear about it again. I don't think. I can't remember any other place. There might be, but I don't, I don't recall any prominent place where we talk about it. Is I could be mistaken. No, but it does. And then to I mean, not eat the thigh muscle for the whole rest of of Jewish history, well, that, eternity, right? Because because of this. I mean that that that's a that that that's a that's another matter, right? That's a that's a matter of how. You know, uh, primordial stories affect. Um, so, from a biblical criticism point of view, I had a I I wrote a paper um, in, uh, in a, when I was studying to be a rabbi. There was the the traditional wisdom among uh, biblical scholars, right, is that uh, first you have a story, and then from a story comes out a law, right? So you have a story which is you know, Jacob, the story, this ancient primordial story, and it teaches, it teaches that you should, because of this story, you should have, you know, from now on, we'll remember this story and this wrestling with the angel, and as we're going to talk about what this means and why is it so important to remember for all time. But I, I, I read, a, I wrote a story based on the works of a, a, a very well-regarded but controversial biblical scholar whose name is escaping me now, we had the opposite theory, and his theory was that it's the opposite, that there are laws, and then people invent stories that come out of, that the, the go out of the laws. Which was a, a, had a, and he went through the whole Torah and kind of tried to show how he felt the laws all came first, and then out of the laws came all the stories um, to back them up, um, and how every single law actually has a story then that, that it creates. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up at some point, I'll talk about it. Um, and this is one of the key ones, but I mean, it, the, the plain feeling of this seems to be that there is a story that was told about the Jewish people, and then um, as, a, as a tradition, uh, out coming out of this story, <coughs> uh, Jews changed, you know, marked it in some 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 way, um, and I you know I could, I can imagine easily a Native American tradition, you know, come be like this, right? You know, because of some primor primordial story that happened to in the Native American tradition, it affects this custom of Native Americans or, or any other kind of ancient people on their land. Um, but we have this story, something happens to his thigh. We can talk about the thigh afterwards, why the thigh? Um, and then he says, let me go for the day breaks. Why does he say this? Very... Maybe, Why does Angel... maybe the light of day um, diminishes the power or breaks the spell. I mean, I don't want to get magical about it, but, but this is all happening through the night. And, and, and with the, with the break of dawn, there's a shift, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's a it's new, it's, it's a new day, even though the day starts the night before when the sun goes down. Um, mm -hmm. It's very, it's very interesting, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's something you expect to see in a, in a modern horror movie, not in the Torah. So, you right. Know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and but, but I like how you said it's a, it's a, there's a change right that's what's that's what until the breaking of the day so there's a change coming and also this whole experience of Jacob is very much a nighttime experience right he's all alone it's dark nobody else is there he's his fears right if you want to bring that symbolic kind of additional meaning to it right he's he's also he's he's beset by his fears by the thought of Esau by all these things he's wrestling he's wrestling and then there's the, the day breaks which means the end of that level of experience and a new kind of hope right hope and day and all those things which are I guess very human um and then, then Jacob says I will not let thee go unless thou bless me so that the commentators will say something it's obvious that he doesn't think this is an ish anymore right or pretty obvious right he's not he probably would not ask if he thought he was just wrestling with a man he would not ask them right this is at this point he realizes that 
um, this is something unusual that's happening to him. Maybe when it, he touched his thigh and suddenly something happened. Um, and then very curious, right? He said to him, what is thy name? And he said, Yaakov. Isn't this, I, I, I have always found this to be very unusual, depending how you take that question, because if he's a divine being, didn't he just attack Jacob on purpose? Didn't he know this is Jacob? I mean, right. Right. He wasn't given that information when the divinity sent him down to wrestle with him. The divinity said, yeah, go, go and wrestle with this particular guy. So he wrestles with the guy and uh, isn't, isn't even interested maybe in what his name, I'm, I'm just teasing, but uh, it's, it, is curious, it is curious that uh, he doesn't know the name and if this is if this is one of the forces sent by the divinity maybe it tells you how limited those things are as far as uh, informational or intelligence no but, but give it, it not privy it, not right it kind of, you it, it makes one almost think like a, a creature a, a, a being of the forest almost more in some you know than a high angel but you could he says to him, go ahead Phil, go ahead. Could it not be, and I've never thought of this before, that uh, in light of what David said, though, it comes out for me. Uh, could it not be that uh, the 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 Ish, the uh, figure, asks him his name because that's part of the formula. You ask the name, and then he's going to give you a new name. Right. Because, right. Uh, it's that so, so it's a, it's kind of like a, a, almost like a literary convention for, you know, for the kind of, of beings that, that can't be out after after daybreak or or something like that, uh, because when he asks him, he says yeah, he asks him to uh, he asks him to uh, he he says I unless you bless me, in beirachtani in ki im beirachtani unless unless uh, till you bless me or unless you bless me. Which is so interesting, and yeah. I and I thought, oh, that's like his old blessings. And then I see Rashi says that he's confirming. Rashi says, "Confirm for me the blessings with which my father blessed me." So he he wants to legitimate the blessings that he got, as uh, Nancy pointed out, uh, less than in, in a pure way. It seems like it would be a lot less powerful if, after wrestling all night. The Ish said to Jacob, okay, we wrestled all night. Here's your new name. Goodbye. As opposed to yeah. we wrestled all night. You did a good job. <laughs> um, what's your, you know, what is your name? Oh, it's Jacob. Yeah. All right. Not anymore. We're going to give you an honor, you know, sort of in recognition of what we just went through. You have a uh -huh. new name. It just it seems like it becomes more powerful and and a better story Def than just ah, here's here, you know I'm going to give you a new name. The, the other part of this is it doesn't seem that Jacob is terrified by this. I I think that most uh, people, if they had one of these creatures come and wrestle with them at night, uh, would be probably a made a little bit anxious, uh, perhaps. Uh, but wouldn't have the power to be able to ask the creature at the end of the wrestling match to get to bless him. So there, there's a, mm -hmm. Jacob is the sort of guy who is open to these creatures, has seen some things like this before, and is not totally surprised by this kind of an event. Because he's had experience with this before. This is not his first. Right. He 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 had, he had his latter experience, which sort of opened him up to something from above him, and then this thing uh, descends and starts to diddle him a little bit. There, there's also a sexual dimension to this. You know, to touch the inside of a man's thigh. Meant uh, and and that's used often in the Torah where people have vows where they touch their thigh. Mm -hmm. They're yeah, probably talking about touching their uh, their genitals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you but know, here we, here it's probably not. The other is it is, but here 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 it's kind of specific about where it is. Um, the kaf of the yerech, but uh, 
but it's true. Uh, it is interpreted as being related uh, to uh, to kind of his his sexual. Uh, I mean, one of the one of the commentators say that it's a little a little divine uh, message about marrying the two sisters. That God wasn't too happy about that. Um, but the uh, I mean the he didn't the, want to marry, but he didn't want to marry. I know Leia. he could have. He, he wanted to marry Rachel. It's true, but he could have. He could have just settled for Leah and then not married Rachel, but. But, but and then the Torah wasn't given, but it's kind of like a nod to later Torah that says you can't marry two sisters, right? So it's not given yet, but he should have known better. I mean, you know, that's a, a comment, commentary. But uh, based, some as we'll read, some some of the commentators will say when the angel says, "What is thy name?" When, like when God says to Adam, "Where are you?" Like I, you know, God knows where Adam is. You know, it's it's uh, it's setting up a conversation. Um, it's it's uh, it's 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 an important it's well others do say you know the the angel didn't know it and you know Rabbeinu Bachia goes into an, a long long thing about it. We'll, we'll read some of it. Um, I wanted to follow up on something that David said about that you know this this wasn't his first dream, um, and I was just thinking or wondering. Um, you know, we have a prayer that we say before we go to sleep to, you know, asking God to protect us. Mm -hmm. And then we pray in the morning, thanking God for having protected us. And I'm just thinking that particularly at this time, you know, it was probably a relatively common thing maybe not you know praying to the hebrew god but to the gods you know for for protection when you go to sleep because who knows what's going to happen to you um and you know thanking the yeah. gods for for protecting you and you know i'm just wondering if this doesn't fit in with that maybe it's heightened a bit in terms of the dream and the importance, but that it may have been fairly well, common for people to to have had similar kinds of dreams. Well, there there is something called hypnagogic phenomena, which we even still talk about now, which are experiences like this. They're sort of uh, partially materialized experiences when you're awaking and when you're going to sleep, when you're in between the state of sleeping and being awake, you're sort of exposed to these kinds of experiences. And there's some people that have many of them. And there's some, you know, and, and some people very rarely, maybe once in a lifetime, something like this. But it, it sounds to me like after he had the latter experience where he's connected to the uh, uh, maybe one of maybe the next level up of the four levels of being that the Hebrews talk about, that uh, he's going to be more open to these uh, so-called hypnagogic phenomena, which is a modern word. I'm sure Jacob wouldn't call it that. So, uh, yeah, probably not. But the, I mean, two things. One, I was thinking of Dali, as you were saying that. I mean, but in the the, the waking up and going to sleep, right, Dali. Who used to paint his paintings by catching the images just you know in the moment as he was falling asleep. But I, I also, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of based on what uh, Alan was saying, a lot of ancient cultures, right, who had a, a fear of the night and and really feel that night is when when I was in Nepal, people felt were worried that that was when you know people in the village would turn into witches and come and assail them, right? So the night has you know, the, we forget what the night is like because we have light bulbs, you know, we have light, we have light bulbs and light and homes are lit and we live in cities mainly. And, but the nighttime in a, you know, in a place where there is wild animals and, you know, it's a very, very different kind of affair. Uh, but here it's also something different though, because it's not, it is all night long he wrestles with this forest. And I think one question we ask is, I mean, if you were, 
not, not to look at this through the prism of previous conversations we're reading, but just reading it. I mean, is this is this a positive or negative force? Being is this an, a good force or an evil force? A good force because ultimately it does bless Jacob. Yeah, but he doesn't know that while he's wrestling with it, right? Yeah. And maybe no. he's wrestling with it because because it has some sort of threatening aspect to it. I think it's an but for, for us blessing. It's beyond good and evil. This force. Very nice. Well, well the look the 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 the, the, the Bilam, right? The pro the, the evil prophet who ends up blessing the children of Israel. So blessing can also come from you know bless, We we think of blessing. We think. Um, only of positive blessing, because we're looking at it through a whole millennia of culture, but blessing in the, in, in, the, in the Torah is something a little bit more concrete in some ways. It's, you know, receiving, receiving uh, good things in your life, you know, or a good, you know, could also be a spiritual blessing, um, but it's not associated with goodness necessarily, you know, coming from God only and, and everything. So it's interesting, right? And then, then we have this, what is thy name? And he says, Yaakov, thy name shall, no, shall be called no more Yaakov, but Yisrael, um, for thou have, and this is interesting because here it's the word you would have expected for um, wrestling, which we didn't have earlier, Kisarita, for you with God and with men and with and Vetuchal, which is a, a weird word for, for it really means that he finished, and he, but I guess it can be prevailed too. And then Yaakov asked and said, tell me, I pray thee thy name. And he said, why is it that thou asked my name? I.e., I'm not going to tell you my name. And he blessed him there. Um, why won't he tell him his name? What is, how does it add to you? I, I think the name gives the creature power, power over you. You know, so maybe he hasn't decided whether the creature is uh, going to be good for him or bad for him. So he's not going to tell him his name. Naming is a big deal when you're dealing with the world. Uh, the, the cre no, this is the opposite. This is the angel who won't tell him his name at this point. It, right. Right now, if the oh, okay, well, it, it's it's the if you get the name of the angel, you have control over the angel. Exactly. Yeah. So he doesn't why tell him his name, and though the the Kabbalah goes to you know has endless stuff on all the names of the angels, the Torah, the the Tanakh, the Bible, um, I, does not reveal the names of angels in almost any case. It's always later tradition that tells you, oh, okay, this is usually it's just telling you as a malach or an ish or whatever. So let, let's let's start to get into a little commentaries and see what we can get from all of this. I have a question, and this may be way off topic, but if yeah. if Jacob's if Jacob's hip is wrenched and it's the inside, I've always thought it was the outside of the hip, but now David uh -huh. is saying no. There's there's a sexual undercurrent to this, and it's the inside of the hip. So it's, it's what Phil? You Phil, you just went muted. What so, what Phil? Phil, you're yeah. muted. You're muted, Phil. I'm sorry. It's the hollow of the hip. I think that's pretty clear. So it's not this. I don't think it's this. It's not the inner thigh. It's okay. the hip th hollow. There's a lot. There's a lot of learning on that. I mean, and and it's not. It, it's like you know. Did Freud say? Uh, uh, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. A cigar. Well, yeah. Well, but I, how, I, how do you yeah. touch somebody on the hollow of a hip? The hollow of the hip is a very internal thing. You know, the hip, it's right it's, where the where the where the bone goes in there. You can't touch somebody there. Yeah. It's where the hip socket right, is, right. is I know. joined. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. Well, you're the doctor. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't think you could. Well, in any case, yeah. you're you're in the region of of the genitals too. Okay. Okay, well, well, my my question, which may be completely off base, is maybe maybe wrenching the hip is cutting off um, Jacob's fertility because Rachel's pregnant during all of this. 
right? She's the last one. She's put, she and, and Jacob, she and Joseph are put behind Leah's children, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, also because they're the youngest children, but also she's pregnant and, yes. and she dies later on in this Parsha giving birth to Benjamin. So I'm mm-hmm. wondering if this is like a foreshadowing of of Jacob Jacob after this is no longer has no longer has any more children so this is it after Benjamin is born and Rachel dies I'm just wondering if maybe, maybe there's a connection to that because they're all yeah. in the same car show and you did bring up yeah very interesting very interesting I don't know yeah. I'm just throwing it out there no it it, it it is it is very interesting um <clears throat> you know the whole the whole uh consequence of a, a dietary custom that comes out of it um leads one to to, to think that it's uh you know the symbolism may not be but but there's i mean there is there is an experience that people talk about uh, experience it's also physical of feeling um an experience in that part of the leg related to uh to uh to energy um but maybe we can talk about that at a different time um so i i, I don't know it's all you know it's uh, to some degree this experience I, I i tend to think of it also the way i think of the burning bush um which is you know, a bush that's burning and not consumed. You know, there's endless midrashic reasons. What is the bush that's burning and not consumed? I tend to think of it, you know, Moses saw light in the bush and to his eyes as a primordial person, as a, you know, a person of 4,000 years ago or whoever, you know, it looks like a bush that's burning and not consumed, but he saw light in the bush, you know, and so Jacob is trying to explain something that's happening to him, a feeling of, of busted by an ish or whatever it is, or whatever that's a, and he's, and he's having experiences that he can't quite explain. Um, so we're, you know, we're, you know, when you're it, as, as physical as beings living this world, when we have spiritual experiences, we try and explain them as best we can using the imagery. You know, when you talk about, you know, the chariots of Ezekiel, you know, what did he really see? You know, did he see chariots or is that just the way his mind interpreted? Because that's what he knew because he knew chariots, you know, and that's, you know, he, you know, and if, you know, it's, we, we see things in the ways that we understand. If your mind has no way of understanding something, you've got to use an image that you're familiar with. Um, and then you use that. So that, I mean, that's a very long standing debate uh, about some of these things, which is, you know, God, God makes things appear in ways that you can understand them. You know, if you're if you're Ezekiel and God makes a plane appear in your vision, you're gonna you can have no is is no frame of reference. You know, so we we all have frames of re- you know visions happen within frames of reference um, with the divine interacting. Whether you think it's our mind that's interpreting something greater, or whether you think it's the divine that's creating these visions for us to understand, but we. You know, God's got to speak to us in a language, in a way that our, in images that our mind will understand. You know, if 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 God is having an ancient person have an image of a computer, it's going to be completely meaningless to the person. So you know, everything everything happens in a way that it has is able to them for them to have that experience. Um, but let's start to read. Uh, I'm going to skip this because we don't have much time. This is just a, a whole, a whole comment about the word for to wrestle, which seems to be related to the word for dust. And, and so they think dust, and um, it's kind of like he kind of put dust into his face, or you know, also conveying some of the darkness of what was happening. He couldn't understand. There was dust. He's fighting with a force, right? It's, it's hard to understand what it is. Uh, going that, on here. The um, last sentence of that commentary, though, yeah. is very interesting. Yes. Which one? 
Our rabbis Go ahead, Blessed, if you want to. explained that he, and I'm assuming yes, exactly. he's talking exactly. about that's the Ish, Esau. For sure. Esau is guardian angels. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a, this is a whole, one of the big topics of my Yom Kippur, uh, Rosh Hashanah sermon this year was talking about this, but, uh, right, so there, there's a whole stream of tradition that sees this as an evil being, right, we all have guardian angels, and this is Esau's guardian angel that attacked him, yeah. and so before he defeated, this is, this is the moment where he defeats Esau, right, And so it's not a it's not a divine test. He is literally fighting an evil being. And so if you look at our so this is the way I interpret um, when you look at this right um, the window the gropper window where uh, there's an there's a ladder at the top of the room. I don't know if you can all picture that. And Jacob in our synagogue and Jacob is facing what looks like a demon like creature. I don't know if here I'll I'll pull it up if I can get to it. I think it's worth just because of this being such a, an iconic part of our synagogue. Um, let's see if I'm just gonna take a second. So Gropper obviously was very connected to Midrash, at least in my mind. Um and let's see. Window of good evil. So I'm going to share a screen now. You see, this is the dream of the ladder, but look at the look at look at who this is Jacob thing, and there you see on the other side there's this demonic looking being. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So who is that? So in my mind, that's Esau, can only be Esau because this is the ladder and the angels and we see him wrestling with the angel later. Um, but I think that why is Esau portrayed so demonically? I think it's related to some of this this guardian angel who later assaults him and you know, this whole idea of Esau being demonic. But I mean, uh, he has horns. Who else could have, he has horns, right? So I, I think this must be an interpretation of somehow maybe Esau's guardian angel or or just a, a view of Esau as being demonic. Um, kind, of, kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Jacob so, was upside down grabbing onto whatever that creature with the horns was, the 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 heel, he was grabbing onto the heel of that creature with the horns. Jacob was upside down in that. Yep, yeah, he's obviously going through something, right? He's churning, he's he's going through something. So let's let's start here, because this is stuff we've been talking about. So this is Hiskuni. Somebody read for us, please. A man began to wrestle with him. The man was an angel who had assumed the form of a human being. The angel, Esau's protective power, had come to prevent Yaakov from escaping from Esau. He realized soon that God's assurances to Yaakov were strong enough to protect him against being harmed by Esau. Mm. So, I go on? That, but that, their hair is quoting Rosh. So, but the, the next one is Radak. I didn't put it. The next one is actually Radak. Um, okay. So, oh, okay, this um, is right there. Okay. So now, but, 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 but what I think is beautiful, really interesting about that, if it's Esau's guardian angel, it becomes like a, a force of good versus evil, right? It's kind of like God versus evil, ain't Jacob's angel versus Esau's angel. It's a, it's, it makes a much more powerful moment in a certain kind of way. Um, that, that's, now we have Radak. Yeah, go ahead. But that's taking, Esau as evil, which is a, certainly a rabbinical idea, but here yes. in the text, it's, it's certainly an adversary and a threat, mm -hmm. but I, I'm uncomfortable calling him evil, especially when the two brothers embrace. Yep. That's all I have. Yep. All right. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, do you mind continuing, uh, Phil, with the Radak? Okay. Ish, 
the same type of each of man as in Joshua, uh, that is an angel. This was the angel Gabriel described as ish par excellence in Daniel. The reason why these angels are called ish, man, is because they appear to the people with whom they converse in human guise. The types of angels who speak with man are referred to as ish as they appear either in a vision or while the person to whom they appear is fully awake. God had sent this angel to Yaakov to strengthen his courage, not to fear Esau. If Yaakov could prevail over an angel, surely he had no reason to be afraid of an encounter with someone like Esau. The fact that the struggle lasted until daybreak was an allusion to Yaakov that after a period of night, i.e. of problems, adversity, there would come a period of light, peace, and prosperity coupled with security. Hmm. A nice interpretation, right? I feel like some of that feels uh, quite, quite, quite uh, modern and, and, and pshatish like as well too. But let's continue. Um, his kuni. Nancy, would you like to read? Sure. Um, whatever the Hebrew is translates to that he could not overpower Yaakov. The words in Hebrew must be understood. He could not. Yeah. yeah, he could not overpower Yaakov. The words, the Hebrew words, must be understood in the sense that Moses used them before taking leave from his people when he said in Deuteronomy. At. I can I cannot any longer lead you in war where he was physically fully able, but God had forbidden him to do so. Okay, we can, we can go for it. We can go for it. Um, okay. um, as, a sign, as a sign that you have departed from me in peace, that I will not suffer harm or damage through having been in a struggle with you. Now that it had become daylight, Yaakov realized for the first time that his adversary had been an angel. And now we come to the place of the question. This is Radak again. What it, when when he asked angel, when when the angel asked him, well, "What is your name?" Okay. This question is only an opener for the dialogue that follows. Yeah, like what Phil said, we have several such examples, such as in Genesis 3-9, where God asks Adam, where are you? Though he was perfectly aware of Adam's whereabouts. Similarly, in Exodus 4-2, God asked Moses, what is this in your hand? Knowing full well that Moses was holding a staff in his hand. Here too, Yaakov was well aware who the angel was, was seeing that he had been sent to him specifically. Okay. Um, okay. Then there the angel says, why is it thou asked after my name? Um, Ramban. Mm -hmm. The ahead. angel said, there is no advantage to you in knowing my name, for no one possesses the power and the capability other than God alone. If you will call upon me, I will not answer you nor will I save you from your trouble. However, I will now bless you, for so I am commanded. Leviticus. But scripture does not explain the contents of the blessing. That which our rabbis have said, mentioned in Rashi verse 27, see also explanatory note on this verse in my Hebrew commentary, page 186, is most probable, namely, that the angel, despite himself, conceded to him at that place the legitimacy of his father Isaac's blessings, as Jacob did not wish to wait for him until he arrived at Bethel. Do you know, just to mention something okay. about the power of a name, in yeah. modern times, we, we really believe in the power of names. For example, I go to the doctor and I'm ailing. I have something that's unknown to me, and the doctor points a staff and he says, you have Tutu Gamushi's disease. And all of a sudden I relax because the thing that I have has been named by the doctor. So na naming has a huge, huge power, especially in medicine. But the difference is, yes, you, you get a name and then you can go home and you can look it up and talk to your friends and stuff. But here you're talking about being given a name that has real meaning. You can take that mm -hmm. name and you can parse it and, uh, you know, 
see what people think about you or think about what will become of you or your descendants or your, your, your ancestors because it all has a name. I mean, so very, very nice meaning. Colin, if, if, you were to, if you were to wrestle with an angel tonight and in the morning the angel were to tell you your name no longer Alan, but something else, how would you, how would you feel about that experience? Life, life transforming, probably. I mean, God has given you a new name. Yeah, but it, if I would have to, you know, I would have to know what the new name meant. Right. You know, today, you know, I think then you gave somebody a new name in Hebrew um, or the language, the language in the vernacular, and they understood you know, what, what the meaning was. If somebody said, your name is no longer Alan, it's Robert, I would go, oh, I guess, <laughs> guess I better go to Google and figure out what Robert means. And it kind yeah. of takes, it takes a little bit away from the story. It does. Um, interesting. Well, it, it's, uh, I mean, it happens to Abraham, right? God speaks to Abraham and says, you will no longer be the only name as Abraham, you will now be Abraham. So it's kind of a sign of being empowered by God to receive a new name. name. And, and also Jacob's name, right? This, uh, I, I'm not sure I even thought, I just thought it fully crossed my mind. The wise Jacob, Yaakov means heel. So his name up until now is because he's grabbing the heel of Esau. And in this moment of confronting Esau, his name has changed from being heel to Israel, which seems to be a better name than heel. Um, yeah. I thought that was Nancy's point, actually. Maybe it was not uh, about grabbing the heel of the of the man that he was capitulating. It is, the, is the word heel in Hebrew there? Because, you know, in the Garden of Eden, uh, the uh, snake is then going to be ground down into the dirt by the heel of the woman. Uh, or, or is is heel uh, something that's in here in the same the same word or no? Well, heel is in Yaakov. Yaakov Ekev is a, is the heel. Oh, Ekev. Is that is that the word that they use for the heel of the snake in the Garden of Eden? Go check. Um, <laughs> Let's go find out. So, uh, okay, good. Well, we're not gonna we're not gonna read the really long book, which is uh, all about the philosoph philosophical and kabbalistic interpretation. But which is fine. I think in some ways this is more interesting. Um, but we're gonna. I wanted to. I'll show you two. Because two things. One story of the um, the heel, but the heel is right as the part of you touches the ground, you know, the part of the foot that touches the ground. Um, yeah, let's see. It's a four or five, three, okay. Here we go. Um, Facial strength is required. It's Genesis 3.15. There we go, okay. Yep, yeah, Akev. You see, like Yaakov, Rosh Vata, Feinu Akev, and you shall strike at their. They shall strike at your head, and you shall strike at their heel. Um, he's telling. Um, yeah, so it's not. It's not. It, this is the moment where Yaakov is no longer a heel, um, and then uh, what I wanted to share as well. Actually, this can stay here. Um, <clears throat> at Jacob's deathbed, when he's blessing the lads, right? He's blessing his grandchildren, Manasseh and Ephraim. What is the blessing? Um, this is a song that's really, you know, become popular rights. But and he blessed Joseph, saying, "The God in whose ways my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked has been my shepherd from my birth to this day. The messenger, the Malach, really the angel who has redeemed me from all harm, blessed the lads. In them may my name be recalled, and the names of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and may they be 
teeming multitudes upon the earth. So does this connect somehow to this story? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My father, the messenger who has redeemed me from all harm. The angel who has redeemed me from all harm. Um, like what happened here? Yeah. Give a better translation of this. But this is a song that they sing in summer camps a lot. Oh, here we go. Um, anyway. So, um, wait, where do we do? I must have skipped it. Here we go. Hamalach Abuelotti, right? The angel redeem me from all evil, blessed lads, and let my name be named on them in the names of my fathers, Abraham and Yitzchak, and let them grow into a multitude into the midst of the earth. So Jacob clearly felt that there was a, a, a divine being, an angel, a messenger, a divine messenger that guarded him his, in his life, and he was now asking for protection. So I, it came to mind when, when uh, Alan was talking earlier about us praying for protection. Um, so in some ways, the, we, Jacob is the one who opens up his door praying for protection from an angel. This, he's the first one, right? So um, he's the one who's accosted by an angel, and then he's the one who we turn to and uh, to, protect, to, to pray to for protection. Um, so there's uh, a spiritual opening that's happening with this wrestling with the angel too. And this is where the name Israel comes from. So this is a moment of consequence for Jacob, but really a moment of birth, of spiritual birth for our for our, for the Jewish people, right? We could say that the Jewish people are spiritually born maybe at this moment, um, or one of the moments, you know, obviously Sinai is the, the big moment, but this is a, a, a moment where we, we receive our name. Israel is the spiritual name of a Jewish people. Um, and so it's related to the, the struggle with this Ish, with Joseph, what he's going through, with um, all of it. Um, and so uh, this is this is this is this is the the blessing that we still carry, the blessing that he that he found in that moment of prevailing against the spirit, whether it's an evil spirit or an angelic spirit come to um, come to test him. Um, and this is always still carry as as the marker of our people. So thanks everyone. Uh, see you next week.